house, which is really the being in his presence, that there is no room for shame. There's no room for hurt because his desire is to take those things and to make us brand new. I'm just so excited that we are able to come together, uh, even on this online fashion. Um, man, it's cold outside. I was, it was six degrees this morning rolling on in and it, it made me remember what it was like being in Iowa and I'm, and I'm thankful that the Lord called us down here but here we are it's still cold there's ice everywhere I hope that everyone out there is being safe and, uh, and that you are warm in your homes right now and it really is just a privilege for us to be able to come and worship with you in your homes and I'm, rem I'm reminded of the the series we had back in whenever we were kind of in the middle of the pandemic and there was a message called Rooms of Revival. And, and the whole theme of that message was that, that your house, that your room right now, right where you are, can be a place where God desires and wants to come even in these moments that we're worshiping together to bring revival to you personally. Because how many of you know that he's a personal God? I'm thankful that, that he is the God over all creation, yet he sees us as individuals and desires desires to make himself known personally to each and every one of us. Oh man, I'm excited to, to encounter God with you on this live platform this morning. Um, I'm Pastor TW. For those of you who aren't or who, who normally don't come here, but you're here with us this morning, I have the privilege and the opportunity to be the lead pastor here at Little Chapel Church. And, uh, and this is our worship team, and we're going to have an awesome word this morning from our associate pastor, Pastor Ronnie, that's going to challenge us to, to, to really receive the love that God has for us. If you are new here, and um, or maybe you're new online, and you're just interested to what we have going on here at Little Chapel, I want to encourage you to text the word "welcome." And I'm going to have to do this slow because there's no slides right now. Text the word "welcome" to our number, and that number is 618. 777-6779. We'll have an admin go ahead and put that information in the chat below. 618-777-6779. Text the word welcome and we'll get you connected with everything we have going on here at Little Chapel Church. Next week, we have our, our biannual business meeting scheduled for directly following our, uh, our morning service or our morning encounter service. So uh, continue to, to keep that in your mind. We'll, we'll finish our service. We'll sign in. And, and then we will conduct our business meeting next Sunday morning after our morning encounter. We have a time for baby dedications. That will be March 14th. So we've had a lot of new babies born, new life. We are, our church, I think during, uh, during this past season is just doing what the Lord said to be fruitful and multiply. Come on, somebody. So we have new babies and we're going to have a, a baby dedication service on March 14th. You can 
sign up for that moms and dads sign your babies up for that on our app or through the website there will also be information at the connect desk right outside in the foyer that you'll be able to sign up um, just in a physical form as well whenever we're back together next week um, we also are we're, we're doing a new push for for an old an old thing that we've done that we had a lot of success with and that's called dinner for six this is a real uh, a, a, a model that we're using to really continue to to emphasize our connect groups the importance of making a big church seem small a church where you might not know everybody but a church where everybody can be known and I think that through this season we've understood the importance of connection even more so than we did before so we want to make sure that if Little Chapel Church is your home, that you are connected with others. That's part of the vision that God has given us, that we want to make sure we're connected. So Dinner for Six is an opportunity for people to gather and get connected. What we would like is to see people who are willing to host a dinner for six and people who are interested in going to a dinner with six. And, and the whole purpose is to get connected with other people, to help find a group that you can be connected with, and to find a place where you can belong through serving. So dinner for six, there's a table in the foyer. You'll also be able to check that out um, through our app and our website as well. And lastly, as we come to a, a time of, of worshiping the Lord with our giving, we really want to, to encourage you to understand that this, our time of giving through our tithes and our offerings is not just something else that we do, that it really is an opportunity in a form of worship to our King. And it blesses his heart to return what is given. As his word says, whatever you sow, you shall, you shall reap a harvest. And we believe that whenever you're sowing into good soil, that a good return is coming. We don't, we don't give to get. We give to see the kingdom of God expanded and furthered. And that's our heart. And we have several ways that you can give. Um, of course, our offering buckets are in the back, but that's not going to do anybody any good this morning. But uh, you can go to our app or the website. And this is a, a reminder. We have a new app. So, so search the little the, the, your app store for the Little Chapel Church app, and if you haven't already, download the new app or update your iPhone devices, and it will um, it will transition everything automatically. So you can give through the app or through the website as we just continue to worship the Lord in that way. It's an honor to us to, to be with you, as I was saying earlier, and so I just want to I just want to lead us in a, a time of prayer. We have. Um, a few prayer requests that we want to keep on the forefront um, of our list as we continue to just believe God to intervene in a mighty way. We're going to continue to lift up Graham Hossman, uh, just believing for complete and total healing in his body. Also for, um, for, for baby Hayden, uh, we're just believing that God will continue to, to work in his, uh, to his, in, in his body as well. That's Hayden Martineau. And uh, we're going to continue to pray for him. And we want to remember um, Lynn Johnson and, and all of her family as, um, as, we're, just, as we're just praying um, for, for the Lord to cover that whole situation very, very well like he does. So join me in prayer as we get ready to come back into a time of worship. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come together in this fashion, in this form. Lord, we give you the glory, the honor, and praise. And just declare this day that you are worthy. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that everything done would be done for your glory. It's all about you, King Jesus. You are worthy of everything that we have to offer to you this morning. Through our worship, through the receiving and the giving of the word, and through the, through, through, through the financial uh, tithes and offerings that are given, Lord Jesus, be glorified through it. And right now specifically, I want to continue to lift up Graham Hossman to you. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in this situation and for what you will continue to do. For baby Hayden right now, Lord, just continue to bring peace to his body, bring total and complete healing to him, bring peace to the family through the situation. And we just want to continue to lift up um, Lynn Johnson and her entire family. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that you provide, the healing that you provide. And we just look to you and we know that you are good. We love you, Lord. It is our honor to worship and praise you this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. We just want to encourage all of you at home today as we know that for a lot of you this morning, you, you want to be here because this is a time when you get together with not only your friends, but your, your family, your church family. And so I just want to encourage you right now at your, at your house. We're going to sing these songs. 
And they're going to be declarations that we're going to sing over you this morning that, that up from the ashes hope would arise and that we know that Jesus is on the throne. And right now in the situation that you may be in and you may be shut in this morning and you, you can't get out and you're maybe even the enemy starting to mess with your mind, we want you to know that we're going to agree with you in prayer this week as a staff. We're going to love on you through our prayers and we're going to begin to lift you up this week as we go through these uh, next few days of just snow being at home and we want you to know this morning that we love you and that we are praying for you and that we believe that even in this time that we're away from each other the Lord is with us and we know that there are two or three gathered all over social media here at this church now and leading you in worship and we're just going to believe that the Lord is going to come and move on your behalf so Lord right now if there's anyone that's at home and maybe even depression and Lord this just feels like to them that it's the enemy just coming after them a little bit more Lord I pray that your name would be strong in their house today that Jesus that you would reign above it all in their house today Lord that we would see beauty from ashes Lord that we would begin to see you move in their homes this morning and touch them in the place that they are so we love you and we give you honor and we give you Praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Man, I'm so thankful that we can declare those words with confidence. You see, there's something about moving and declaring from a place of faith that actually brings you to a place of confidence. Not a confidence in yourself or something that you have to derive within your own ability, but it's coming from a greater place. And that's really what faith is. Faith isn't something that that you strengthen according to yourself. It is strengthened from the truth of who Jesus really is and, 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 and the place that he sets upon your heart. What a declaration to declare that Jesus, you reign above it all. In John chapter 5, I was, I was just drawn to this yesterday and today. I just couldn't get away from it. And it, it talks about the beginning of the chapter, how, how Jesus is, is doing what Jesus does. He's moving from place to place. And I want to read to you, um, starting in verse 2, what this says. And, and I'm reading out of the, the NASB. It says, now, there was in Jerusalem... By the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticles. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the move of the waters. For an angel of the Lord would come, and at certain seasons into the pool, stirring the waters. Whoever then, after the stirring, would step in to the waters would be made well from whatever disease and affliction they had. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps in before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. In verse 9, Immediately, the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. As my heart was so just stirred, for, a, for lack of a better word, over this passage, I was just drawn to it, as I said yesterday and this morning, and I'm, and I'm, just, I'm just looking at this, and I'm, and I'm seeing a couple of things that I feel like the Lord wants to, to, to shore up in somebody's heart this morning. I wonder if you heard where it said that in these, in these porticles laid a multitude of people. Yet when Jesus came, he reached out to one. And when he did, it was that the result of asking him, what is it that you want from me? And, and I'm just I'm saying, Lord, what was it about this one? What was it about the one that was laying there that, that, that drew the affection and the attention of Jesus to this place, to, to, to his situation? You see, I believe that even as we know through Scripture, we see that Jesus, knowing the, the intentions of their heart or knowing the thoughts that they had, I know that Jesus walked with an incredible discernment, and I believe that, that, that Jesus discerned the heart of this man in this moment. For he certainly knew who Jesus was, and in this moment, Jesus was drawn to a heart that was hungry for him. And as I was praying even into this this scripture yesterday and today, I felt like the Lord was just speaking to my heart just to remind people out there, the ones who are watching this morning, that he's drawn to a heart of affection towards him. That the love of a father that is not based on condition, the love of Jesus, our Savior, the King of this world, is drawn to hearts that are hungry and thirsty for him, not for what we can get from him, but are just steadfast before them. There's something about a heart that is just that is just ready for what Jesus wants to do in their life that would cause him to move over a multitude of people to find the one whose heart was ready to receive what Jesus had to bring. And so this morning, I feel like the Lord wants to encourage someone to know that he sees your heart. He sees a heart that is ready, that is longing for something that only Jesus can do. And friends, can I just tell you that he's faithful? If he's been faithful for you, even as you're watching, if you can remember the times that he's been faithful, put it in the chat right now. Say, he's done it for me. Let other people know who are watching along with you that what he's done for you, he is faithful to do for someone else. That's the power of the testimony. 
Whenever we can declare what he has done, it is, the, it is the power that releases him to do it again because that's what testimony means, to do it again. So put it in the chat, say he's done it for me. If God has done something that only God could do in your life, put it in the chat, say he's done it for me. And let that be a testimony to those who are out there that feel like you're just laying among the multitudes wondering if he sees you. Friends, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. He sees you and he's there for you. And he reigns above every situation, above everything that you might be facing, that you might be going through. He reigns. He is sovereign and he reigns. Can we sing this chorus just one more time? Thank you, Jesus. You reign. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Yes, Jesus. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign. Father, I thank you for the hope that we have. The very present hope we have in our time of need. You are our help. Holy Spirit, you are our comforter. Jesus, you are our healer, our deliverer, our savior, and our Lord. Be honored and glorified. And we thank you that you are giving us confidence to know that you reign above it all. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Pastor Ronnie's coming up here right now to deliver the word to us. I'm excited for the word that he has. I do believe that, uh, that the Lord has, has spoke to you to challenge us, yeah, all right. to bring us to a place of just knowing how good he is. He is good. He is good. He is. Well, man, go ahead, be blessed, be released, and give it to us in Jesus' name. Don't you love Pastor T.W.? Come on, give it two thumbs up for Pastor T.W. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, hey, happy Valentine's Day. Wow. Did you tell your significant other, the one that you love, that you love them today? I hope you did. And it's kind of one of those uh, weird holidays, I know. It's one of those uh, man-made holidays, I think, to get us to spend more money and to buy candy that we don't need, to buy some flowers that uh, will uh, die someday, uh, pretty, pretty soon by the end of this week. And uh, around 498 A.D., Pope Gelusis, uh, I think his name is, declared February 14th as St. Valentine's Day to honor the martyred uh, Valentinus to end the pagan celebration. Did you know that? So that leads us in today. So I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, about a 1 billion Valentine's cards are sent in the U.S. each year. Did you know that 85% of all Valentines are purchased by women. Did you know that? Parents receive one out of five Valentines. Valentine's Day and Mother's Day are the biggest holidays for giving flowers. Um, men buy most of the millions of boxes of candy and flowers given on Valentine's Day. And here's one. Did you know this? About 15% of women in the U.S. send themselves flowers on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Did you know that? 15%. So, um, and uh, so, you know, today is, uh, I guess, deemed as the day of love, right? The day that uh, we share and uh, we express the love and affection that we have towards our 
loved one. It's a holiday. I know for me, it's, it's kind of like one of those days that, that um, you know, it's kind of redundant. You're supposed to be doing it each and, every year, each and every day. You're supposed to be sharing, telling your wife how much you love them, the one that you care about, how much you love them and appreciate them all year long. And, uh, and for some reason, you find yourself going out and buying a card and, and going through the re- routines. of, and, and you feel like if you don't get something, that, that somehow uh, you, your, your, your loved one or your wife, don't you love me? You think, man, don't you care about, you didn't get me anything on Valentine's Day. And uh, so, but this year, this year we, do, we chose to do something different, me and my wife. Instead of buying each other presents, we just decided, hey, let's go out to dinner. Let's go out to dinner and we'll just call that our presents, our, our, our gift to each other. And I say that is the way to go. You know, each and, every, uh, each and every day throughout this year, I want to continue to, to share with my wife how much I love her and how much I care for her, um, how much she means to me. I just don't want to leave it to, to one day, one day only. But as we enter into this day, into this time, and as, even as you enter into this time of worship, We express our love, not just to our family members and not just to our loved ones, our wife, our children. We need to also and continue to express our love to our loving Heavenly Father. And I want to remind us again this morning of how much God loves you. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know it? You might say, well, I know He loves me. I know that He cares about you, about me. But I think sometimes we get some human love and and godly love mixed up. I think sometimes that we think that God loves the way that we love. And, And we know that our love can be tainted at times. We know that our love can be skewed at times. Our love can be based on conditions at times. A human love can be very different and is very different than the love that God has for us. There's some major differences. Our, our love can be based on a condition. It can be, be, it can be based on how I feel and, 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 and the things that I do. And, but God's love is very different than that. And we need to know that God loves us. If we're going to progress in a relationship with the Heavenly Father, we need to know this. I remember that when Bethan and I first started dating. It was, uh, you know, 22 years or so ago, and uh, man, a long time, and we first started going out, and, and everything was good, and, and I, I really liked her, and, and I know she liked me, and some time passed, and we actually entered into this dating relationship, and, and I was time trying to take things really slow. I mean, I was just, I mean, I, I just wanted to take things really slow. I just didn't want to jump head over heels into this relationship. And even though I I really liked her, I just wanted to take things really slow. So I didn't hold her hand a whole lot. In fact, it took took a, a month or so before I even gave her a kiss. Can you imagine that? In fact, she even last night, we were talking about this, and she even said, I was just trying to think. Uh, she, she, no, I mean, I know what she said, but I realize this is online, and, and I don't want to be politically correct. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'll just say, this is what she said to me, and she said, I thought you were gay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, and uh, which I didn't realize that, but I was just trying to take things really slow, you know. I, I just didn't want to just jump right in there, and uh, and, and so, so one particular night, as our relationship continued to gra- progress, she said those words to me. Can you imagine? I mean, she just went for it. She said those words to me. Those three words, I think, that we all long to hear someday in our life. She said to me, she looked me in the eyes and she said, I love you. She was, she was pretty forthright. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how great that was. And, 
I was trying to think. I was like, you, do you remember my response, Bethany? And she says, yeah, I remember your response. And she's not very happy when she talks about my response back to her. When she said, she's the first one to say, I love you. My response back to her was this. No lie. She's even here this morning. No lie. My response to her was this. I know. <laughs> I know. And ladies, how would you like to hear that? You know, I know. That was not what she was looking to hear from me. She was hoping, I'm sure, to hear that my response to her was, I love you too. And I almost remember about when the story of, 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 uh, uh, Peter, when he's, he, when he's going up to the shore and he's meeting Jesus and Jesus is asking him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's responding back, you know I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love He said this three times. Never once in that situation, in that scene, did Peter ever say, Jesus, do you love me? But Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me? And I think that's the question we need to even ask ourselves this morning. And maybe even the question you need to even know this morning is that you have a Heavenly Father that loves you. Do you know that God loves you? And maybe He's asking you this morning, do you love, love me? Love is defined in Wikipedia as love encompasses a range of strong and positive emotional and mental states. We're talking about a human love here. Human love is also often looked at as, as disposable, right? In today's society, it can, it, it can be here one moment and, and the next moment it's no longer present anymore. Marriages, once, once, once things get tough and, and someone feels like they don't love you as much anymore, it's, it's just uh, thrown out the window and it's, you, you just go on to the next thing. You go on and you maybe get a divorce. When your favorite shoes wear out, you, you tend to uh, throw them out. Maybe get a new pair. When something's broke, you, you replace it with something new. Man, I really loved that TV until it broke. We associate love it many times with, with emotion status or feelings or a romantic type of feeling. But this is exactly opposite towards God's love for you. And if we have a mis misconception about God's love, if we start thinking that God's love is based on merit, it's based on a feeling, it's based on what we do, and based on how we do and how we respond, is how God is going to respond to us. Man, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get it wrong every time because my love, sometimes I miss it. Sometimes I don't feel very loving. Sometimes it's hard for me to love someone who doesn't love me. And because I, sometimes I feel that way, I have a hard time understanding that there's a love, that's a loving Heavenly Father that simply loves me regardless of my response to Him. When we get to Romans chapter 30, chapter 8, verse 30, 30, uh, 38 through 39. And if you take a moment, man, open your Bibles for a second. Grab your Bibles really quick. And it's Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. And it's Paul. Paul's speaking here. And he's speaking to us. And he says this, For I am persuaded. I love that verse. I love that word persuaded. What he's saying is this, he says, I am, I, for I know, for I know that neither death nor life, what Paul says, hey, you know what, I know this. And later on, he says, I know that nothing will separate us from the love of God. We need to know that Christ, that God loves us. There's a difference from really knowing something, right? I mean, when you know something, you can't can be convinced anything else. When you know something is true, it doesn't matter what anyone else says to you. 
They can try to convince you in a different direction or a different way and try to prove it to you. But down in the being, in your innermost being, you just know, you know, you know, you know that this is true and this is right and that nothing's going to change it. And Paul, he's saying this, for I know, I know that neither death, underline that word, death, nor life, underline that word life, nor angels, nor principalities, underline those words, nor power, underline that word, nor, nor things present, underline that, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, put an underline under that, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's saying, I know. Church, I want to tell you. Do you know? Do you know that nothing will separate you from the love of God? Paul's saying, not even death. Death can't even separate me from the love of God. When I breathe my last... When that moment comes where there's no more breath in me, that doesn't even separate me from the love of God. In fact, it takes me right into his presence, doesn't it? The response, did you know the response of many of the early Christian martyrs that when they were threatened with their life is that they would respond with this, with this response. They would simply say, thank you. Thank you. You're transporting me right in the presence of my Savior. And you can't hurt people like that. When they know that when I leave this place, I'm leaving everything behind and I'm going to my heavenly Savior. I'm going to my Savior, my King. I'm going to be before Him. You can't hurt someone like that. For, for the believer, the death, death is a reward, isn't it? The one who serves the Lord. Man, that's why we fight, don't we? That's why we fight for our loved ones. That's why we, we pray for those that don't know the Lord. That's why our family members are on our prayers and they're on our hearts because we want them to come into a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. We want them to experience the love of God in their life and we pray for them and we'll never stop praying for them. That's why kids, that's why so many young people, they come to me and they say, Ronnie, would you pray with me that my parents would know Christ is the Lord and Savior? And we lift them up in prayer and we partner with them in prayer so they too will know who God is and the love that God has for, for them, for them. We continue to pray. For the believer, it is a great reward. We see even Paul, even at the end of his life, he writes this verse in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 8. You, you remember it, I'm sure. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. He knows that he knows that in this moment his, his days are, are limited. And he writes this verse. He says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the phrase. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, amen, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. And not only to me, but also all who have longed for his appearance. Death, as tragic and as hard as it is to go through for us, for I know, I know what it's experienced to lose loved ones that you love and you care about so deeply, but for them, for them, man, it's just the beginning, right? Right? It's a body without pain. It's a, it's a new home. It's a greater communion with the Heavenly Father. And Paul said, hey, even death, though it may seem like the end, it won't separate me from the love of God because I know this is just the beginning for me. 
And he goes on and says it's not just death, but also life. Life can't separate us from the love of God. Oftentimes, man, it is more difficult to face life many times than even to face death, isn't it? Suicidal thoughts flood into many. We know that even during this time and during the season that we're, that we're in and even as we believe we're coming out of, Many have taken their own life because of isolation, because of feeling like they're alone, feeling like no one else is around. And suicide thoughts flood into many because of life difficulties. Can I tell you, even if this morning, and even if you know someone that is a, that's contemplating a suicide, can I tell you, suicide is just a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And life's and so, so, so we, we, we deal with these, these problems and these failures and the, these disappointments because life tends to bring these things into our life. And life failures and disappointments can only bring you to a place of hopelessness. When you begin to fix your eyes on your failures, on your disappointments, Man, can I tell you, you're taking your focus off the one, the very one that brings hope. Why? Because he is hope. Don't let your disappointments, don't let your failures, it's your experience on your, in this life keep you from losing focus on the very one that will bring hope. Life's failures and disappointments are never meant to keep you, to take you out. They are meant to keep, to, to bring you in to a greater fellowship, to a greater love to the Father. How many times, I know I felt like this. How many times have you just felt like you're unworthy? You're unworthy to be in His presence because of a failure. How many times you just felt like, man, I just can't lift my hands. I just don't feel like I can be in his presence because of a failure, because of the things that I've done and things that I said. Can I tell you that God loves you despite your failures, despite the disappointments, that he'll bring hope and encouragement around you and in you and through you so we can rejoice in failures, can't we? We can rejoice in our failures. Why? Because it shows how much we need a heavenly father. It shows how much we need a savior in my life. Then I'm not perfect. And Paul says, hey, not even life can, can separate me from the love of God. Even life's temptations can't leave you. Can you leave you? Uh, feeling isolated so many times we believe that we're the only one that struggles in this area of temptation. That, that, that we're the only one that, that has these types of feelings. That we're the only one that is struggling in this sin. This is exactly the place the enemy wants you to be in. To feel like you're isolated, that you're all by yourself, that you're all alone, that no one else is around to offer support, to offer encouragement, to offer help, to offer healing, to offer strength. Can I, even in the midst of temptation, where you feel like you're all alone, we have a Heavenly Father, we have a God that is within us. That is here within you. And Jesus is within you. And the Holy Spirit is within you. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. He is presence. And he is the one that is within you. And not only is he within you, the one that is within you loves you. Can I tell you? He also doesn't bring condemnation. Our word tells you, for there, there are those, for uh, those that are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Now think about this. God knows all your sins. He does. I might scare some of you, but he's all knowing. He knows all your sins. He knows them all. He knows your past sins, your secret sins, the things that nobody else knows about. 
He knows what you've been thinking about. He knows what you've been reading about. He knows what you've been watching about. He knows it all. He knows those past ones. You think that, man, if, every, if anyone ever knew or found out about that, he knows those present sins, the ones that are present even now in your life. He even knows the future ones, the ones that they're going to be committed tomorrow and the next day, the next year. He knows them all. Think about this. God knows all your sins, and he still loves you. He still loves you. He still loves you. Does that sink in? How hard is it for us to love those that are around us? How hard is it to even love ourselves because of our failures, because of our sins, our shortcomings? But I want to remind you once again, you have a God that loves you unconditionally unconditionally and we have life sufferings that even in life sufferings that can't keep us can keep us at arm's length from from the lord we keep god at arm's length uh, uh, because of sufferings that we may experience here in this life too many of us we buy into the lies of the enemy that because of suffering or loss in this world is a product of, of God that, that doesn't love you. That if he loved me, then he wouldn't let me go through this. If he cared about me, surely he would have kept this harm from me. If he loved me, surely he wouldn't let me suffer like this. We buy into that. Into that. That's a lie from the enemy, isn't it? Life can bring sufferings. They can be hard. I know at times so very different, difficult, so very hard, so very difficult. But God's love for you is much stronger than any difficulty that you may experience here on this earth. In this moment, as you draw near, near to him, man, he's going to bring comfort to you. He's going to bring pre peace to a broken heart. None of these things, none of these things that we've listed here, none of these things that Paul has mentioned here will uh, keep us from the love of God. He mentions angels and nor principalities, nor powers can separate us, separate us from the love of God. As much as the enemy tries to separate us from God's love, he will fail every time. The only hope he has is for us to begin to start believing that God's love is absent, that it's not present. The things to present, even the things present can't separate. I'm not sure what you're going through right now. I'm not sure even what you're facing right now. But even in the midst of rebellion, God still loves you. In the midst of questioning God, in the midst of not sure, in the midst of wondering, in the midst of even seeking, and maybe you're not even seeking, you have your ears closed. Can I hear if you're listening right now? Even in the midst of that, God still loves you. He still loves you. In the midst of fear, He still loves you. In the midst of your sin, He still loves you. God loves you today. Even in the things to come, Paul says, not just the present, but even in the things to come, I'm not sure what the future will hold for me. I'm not sure where I'll be. I'm not sure what the future will hold for you. But I do know that I have a loving Heavenly Father who loves me very much, and He loves you very much, and He holds that future in His hands. And I'm so grateful for that. And I can put my trust and my faith in that. It can be scary and as you begin to imagine what the future may hold, especially today. Especially to those 
that don't know Christ. But for us, but for us that are believers, that are followers of Jesus Christ, the future I'm not scared of. I'm not fearful of the future. I'm not fearful of tomorrow because I know that it's one day closer, right, to his return. I know it's one day closer to being in his presence for sure. Nor heights or depths. There is no bottom, man. There is no bottom. There is no ceiling that will take a glimpse of separation. And he says, nor any other creatures, anything else, anything else you can mention that can separate? No, there's, there's nothing else I can mention that he can mention that would separate us from the love of God. This is the greatest love story ever told right here. It, it's, it's not my love story for with Bethany. It's not how we met and how our love story began to grow and begin to prosper and where our two lives come from and and how how we're together now. That's not the greatest love story. It's not. The greatest love story is a, is a heavenly father who, who loved you and, and cares about you and desired a relationship with you that even though, even though you may turn your back upon him, even though there be those that will reject him, even though there be those that say, I don't want nothing to do with God, God, even knowing this, sent his son to die for you, for your children for your loved ones, for your neighbors, for those that you meet on the street. He died for them. Even in knowing that those there would be those that would look at the cross and think, and, and think nothing about it. It would not move them in one bit. In fact, they would use God's name as a curse word. Even in the midst of that, God says, I still love you. That I'm going to send my only begotten son. Even in the midst of rejection, I'm going to send my son to die for you because of my love for you. For my love for you. This is called agape love. It's unconditional. It's unmerited. Not determined on our response But I believe that when it's fully understood, I believe that you can't help but give your life to him. Paul wrote in closing, Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. He says this. He uses this phrase. For Christ's love compels us. That word compels means literally It leaves me no choice. It leaves me no choice. Paul's saying, I have no choice but to respond to the love of Christ with my whole being. Christ's love compels me. His love compels me. Listen, his love compels me to serve. His love compels me to give. His love compels me to love those that are unlovable. His love compels me to worship. It compels me to give, forgive. It compels me to show mercy, to share, to be thankful, to be a better father, to be a better husband. His love compels me. Then it compels me to be kind, to lift my hands up a little higher to sing a little louder, to pray a little longer. His love compels me to love God more and more each day. What does God's love compels you to do? What does His love compels you to do? Maybe Jesus is asking This question to you, even this morning, even in your living room this morning, do you love me? Because I know that my Father 
loves you. You know that I love you, but do you love me? Does my love compel you to do something? To a greater love for him? Ephesians, our last verse. I'm closing with this verse this morning. My prayer is this verse right here. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 and 19. It's not only my prayer for you, but it's my prayer for myself. It actually becomes a prayer for myself, honestly, then more than a prayer for you. Because I want to know God's love, even in a greater way than I know already. I think many times we, we pray, I, many times I know as, as ministers, we, we begin to pray for, for those that we're ministering that they would know God's love. And, and although I, I want you to know God's love, but in a greater way, I, I want to know God's love. I want to know His love. I believe in knowing His love. It solves a whole lot of issues in our life. I think many times we, we try to fix the symptoms rather than the root of the issue. I think marriages can be fixed pretty easy by asking a simple question, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? I don't recall any, anywhere that there has been two spirit-filled believers that are in love with Jesus that ever got divorced. Do you love your addiction more than you love Jesus? Do you love that sight more than you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And I realize that as I begin to know his love, his unconditional agape love, even more and more and more, it's going to change my love that I have for him. For him. And Paul is praying here. And he says this, for that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, that you would be rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Now get this, to grasp, to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ. Oh God, let us grasp let us understand, let us hold on to the love of Christ, of how deep and how wide and how long and how high the love of Christ is. And to know, to know this love that surpass, surpasses knowledge, that it's more than just knowledge but it's in my innermost being. It's, it's in my innermost being that nobody can take it away from me. Nobody can debate it uh, away from me. That I know you may have all the points and all the illustrations of why God wouldn't love a wretched man like me, a sinner like me. But I know because the Bible tells me so. I know that down deep inside, that how faulty I am, that I have a loving heavenly Father that loves me, and He loves you. And He ends, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of of God, that you may be filled with the fullness, the measure of God. And when we begin to love like that, 
when we begin to become Christ's love, when we begin to have this, this love that's not based on, on merit, it's not based on, on a condition, but this agape love that he has shown through to me. And now I'm beginning to move and begin to show upon others. And what a work does it do in our community and those that were around. And you might be watching here this morning, and I want to tell you, you might be watching here this morning, you say, you know what, how can God love someone like me? He loves you, and would you respond to him this morning? I want to love him. I may not fully understand his love for me, but I understand that he loves me. And because I understand that he loves me, I now want to have a relationship with him. I want that in my life. And this morning, you can say that prayer. You know, it wasn't long ago. I mean, it was, actually, it was a long time ago. My stepdad, he came to know the Lord by watching a service online. He bowed his knees in his living room, in his own living room, as the minister began to give the call, and he gave his life to the Lord in his living room. It wasn't in a church building. It was in his living room, on his carpet. And his life changed forever since. And that's you this morning. Would you take a moment? take a moment and just pray with me. Maybe you have a family member next to you. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're by yourself. I don't know. If you have someone that is next to you, maybe you just want to reach out and grab their hand really quick. Maybe you just want to say it under your breath. I, I don't know. We just take a moment and say, don't miss this opportunity. Even, the Bible says, even today, today is a day of salvation. So would you say this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you that despite my sin, you love me. I accept your love now. I've blown it a thousand times, and I'll blow it again a thousand times more. I accept your love for me, and I ask, Lord, that you will forgive me, that you'll come into my life, that you'll be my Lord and Savior, that I will be made new, that your love will grow and live and consume my life each and every day. And no longer will I love with a human type of love, but I will love with a godly type of love, with the mind of Christ, with the Holy Spirit that is living and, and moving inside of me each and every day. So fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Love you guys, and uh, love you guys, and we're believing that even as you said that prayer, that this is a start of knowing that God loves you. Amen, amen. Pastor Ronnie, thank you so much for that great reminder. And that's, I, I'm just sitting over here and just... Um, Absolutely, like almost to the point of being undone, just thinking of God's love for, for each and every single one of us. And as Pastor Ronnie was, was speaking, I just began to, in my own mind, just make a list of how good God's love is. The fact that it's pure, it's sacrificial, it's not seeking anything from me other than just me being willing to receive. And it's from receiving that love as Pastor Ronnie was reminding us from the words of Paul that would compel me to a life lived for Jesus and done well. Friends, I know that you've been blessed by this message and this amazing reminder of a heavenly father who loves you purely and perfectly, not based on what you could do or anything that you deserve, 
but simply because you're his. I hope you have a fantastic week and that you stay safe. Um, God's just got incredible things for you. So as we do each and every Sunday, um, you don't have to stand up in your home unless you want to. But I would ask you, even right where you are, would you just raise your hands and just receive the blessing that the Lord wants to put over your life and over you even this day. So may the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May you walk in his favor, live in his glory, experiencing the love of a father that knows no condition or no bounds. The love of a father that has produced mercy over your life in grace extended. May you know that love that gave everything for you to know him. In Jesus' mighty, precious name, amen, amen, amen. Have a fantastic week, everybody. Thank you for joining us online for this live encounter. Amen.